Hello, hola. We want to welcome to our conversation, Promoting Gender, World and Organization, GWO 2022, our conference that will be held in Bogota in June 2022. Just welcome to this activity. Uh, we have been promoting our conference and the colloquium uh, just to let you know that we're working in expanding the GWO community. In our agenda, uh, wait a minute. I have two sounds here. Okay. In our agenda, we're going to present uh, a summary of, the, of our call for streams and the GWO conference. Then we're going to present the uh, Segundo Colloquio, the GW in Latin America. And then we're going to start our conversation, the, the main part of our activity. I am Mari Vera Colina, professor in Universidad Nacional de Colombia, part of the organizing committee of the GW conference in 2022. So I'm going to share my screens just to share with you some of the general aspects of our call for streams and the GWU 2022 conference. The conference uh, will be taking place in Bogota from 22nd to 24th of June, 2022, Colombia. It will be the main venue, it will be a, a conference that will be, uh, the venues will be three universities in Bogota, Universidad Cooperativa in Colombia, in Bogota, Universidad Nacional de Colombia, and Universidad Santo Tomás. The, the, the idea is to have one of the day in, in each university. So we are expecting to have you here next year. Also, we are expecting to have some online sessions because we know this pandemic scenario is, is still uncertain what we, we have in June 2022, but the idea is to have part of the conference here in the city. This, uh, we, we want to present uh, some of the people that are working in this conference. We have a committee from different universities, from different uh, communities and different countries in Latin America. And I'm going to read all the names, but you can see there are some faces and some of the universities from Chile, from Brazil, from Argentina, uh, from Mexico, that are working closely with us to prepare this uh, event and also our colleagues in Colombia working with us, also from different uh, cities, not only from Bogota. They, they, we are just uh, preparing some activities. Mm, the conference for us uh, started some months ago. That's why we are trying to do some activities before the main conference, because the idea is to, to uh, send the message that this is not only a conference for two days, it's a conference for, uh, beyond these three days. And also uh, we want to express our, our, our gratitude to the journal, to the editors, to the editorial committee, to, for the trust and for the support that we are receiving uh, in, in the activities and on organizing the conference. So uh, just uh, some context for these uh, activities and the most important uh, message that I want to send today on behalf of the organizing committee as that we need your faces. We need the stream leaders, the people that are going to propose the topics for discussions in the GWO conference. So your faces will be there uh, soon. Remember that, that the deadline for the uh, call for streams is in this month, at the end of the month. So we are expecting your proposals just to uh, start uh, also the call for papers that will respect to uh, begin uh, to spread the call for papers in October. 
about Bogota, Bogota is located in Colombia, South America is one of the biggest city of the continent. Uh, it's uh, around 9 million people uh, living in Bogota and surrounding areas. It's a, a city located in the Indian mountains. So don't, don't, don't uh, think about you are going to be in the Caribbean Sea, you're going to be in the, in the Indians, in the mountains. The, you can see the, the altitudes there. Uh, we speak Spanish, as you can see in my, in my, my accent. Uh, we speak Spanish, we, we welcome you in different languages, but our main language is Spanish. Uh, we have excellent um, communication with uh, the airlines, international airports, 2 million visitors each year, uh, approximately. Uh, about the pandemic, we can talk about this. Of course, it's a problem in the world. We, uh, we, can, we have to check how this is evolving in the next months, but of course it's a scenario that we can avoid. And the temperature will be in the city in the high mountains is around 15 degrees during the year. Um, our venues, physical venues, will be Universidad Cooperativa in Bogota, Universidad Nacional de Colombia, and also Universidad Santo Tomás, the idea is to have some sessions in each of these universities. They are located in downtown Bogota. They are close to each other. And of course, we can avoid to think about online sessions. We are trying to, to prepare to plan a hybrid conference. Uh, so uh, we, we need to prepare for what uh, happen with people that can travel because of the pandemic and because of restrictions that we know we are having uh, uh, people that are losing jobs, especially in the academic sector. So we are also taking into consideration this uh, possibility or this reality. Uh, the call for strings, uh, you, you can see in our networks, the, the files, I'm not going to read all of this because we, can, we want to have time for our conversation, but remember that you need to send the proposals for uh, before September 30. And the one of the some of the most uh, important aspect that I want to highlight is that we want to uh, attract uh, sessions in different languages. We are in Latin America, so uh, we uh, our main language is Spanish and Portuguese. Some uh, countries also have the, as a main language of French, and of course, English as, as a, one of the international languages. So uh, the idea is if you feel free to send your proposal, for example, if you want to attract papers or abstracts in Spanish, you can do that, or in Portuguese. You don't need only to think about uh, abstracts in English. Abstracts in English are, are work on that, proposals. Uh, for students in English are welcome, of course, but it's not a, a limitation. So the idea is we have a multi-language conference. It's a challenge also, but this is a, one of the characteristics. Um, other aspect that you can see in our documents in the files, uh, the BBS, the proposal is around um, 15, 1500 words. It's, it's a short document where you express the main ideas of your proposal for the stream. Uh, you need to express, express if you are going to um, have a call for papers or for ASTAT, what's the idea of your session. Um, uh, we are expecting to have multi-regional teams leading the sessions, the, the streams. As I was saying, the deadline is close, is, is, is really close. So please uh, take in, uh, in consider into consideration this deadline because the conference is also um, close in June. So we need to prepare the call for papers. And the idea is to receive your proposals and send you uh, an answer and approval or comments before October 31st. So no observes. Just to take into account, I, I'm not going to read all of this, but you can you can check into the file the um, the responsibilities, the duties of the leaders of the call for strings. 
So remember that this is a conference and we, are, we consider ourselves an organizing committee as a macro committee. You are the, the stars of the conference. Really, when you prepare a stream, you are uh, um, putting into life the discussions of the conference. So the, the idea is to think about uh, what topics do you want to discuss and you will be responsible also to support all the team of the conference circulating this call for papers and uh, um, depending on the topic that uh, you select it is also expected in the future that after the review uh, it could be also a potential a potential special issue uh, for the journal if if the topic if is of interest, if, and of course the discussion during the conference a draft and of paper. So the idea is to check uh, this, these duties uh, in the document with the, um, also the, the possibility of, you, you, can, you can just not only go and present the paper, just it's, it's beyond that, it's beyond the conference. Um, other aspect, important aspect is that we uh, suggest that you think in one round the call, call for papers in your stream, or maybe in two rounds, depending of if your, if your stream will be online or it will be on-site. For on-site uh, streams, it's important that if people is going to travel from abroad, maybe you need to prepare your travel. And so that's why we are suggesting two rounds, but it's a decision of the leaders of the stream. If you only want to use one of these dates, number one, number two, or if you can include the two rounds in your proposal. Um, so an idea, some general ideas about our motivations in the call for streams, as you can read there, uh, our main idea is to build bridges in research, in community building, in um, decolonization, especially in critical approaches about not only about gender studies, about uh, business studies, about uh, regional studies. So the idea is to bring the discussions to our community in gender work and organization, and especially uh, bring these discussions to our regional studies. So, so welcome to Bogota. We, we invite you to Bogota to uh, be on site or maybe online, but the idea is to have the discussion. So I'm going to be quickly because of the time, but the idea is to, uh, that you can read our motivation in, in, the, in the document, in the call for streams, uh, because we need to um, just to highlight this, uh, the importance that we uh, are trying to, to um, always put in the first place, this idea of building bridges, building communities, and over, how overcome obstacles, how overcome uh, inequalities. In the, in the call for streams, you can see some questions, some guiding questions. It's not a limitation, it's not an uh, uh, exclusive lift, but the idea is to have some people ask about some topics. You can see some of the topics that we thought about, but it's not a limitation uh, about organizations, about research, about education, but you can propose your own uh, idea, your own discussion. Also, we will have a separate stream for general topics that maybe are not included in the streams that, that will be selected. Uh, you have there a Q QR code that you can use your, your cameras and this uh, will do, um, can send you to a folder in Google Drive with some files while we prepare the website. The website is under construction, that, that's why we are using a Google Drive app for that. And, but the, it's mostly the, the information that I wanted to share. We're preparing the call for the Emergence Scholars Colloquium, will be uh, one day before the conference to have a specific space for our PhD and master students and other 
uh, young scholars, emerging scholars, so more details soon about the colloquium. And one of the, if you want to contact us, our email in the QR folder, in the QR code, you can find the folder, you have their uh, forms in Google to send some questions, to send comments, and we will uh, send you the information about the website. I think in two weeks, the website will be running properly. We have a, a draft, but it's still under construction. So that's the information that I wanted to share with you. Uh, if you have question comments, please use the chat there in the in the YouTube in, in box, and uh, we can answer the questions after the the conversation. So this is mostly the information that we wanted to share. Thank you for joining to the session. Now I am going to. Send the, the mic microphone to Professor Suray Melgarejo. Professor Suray Melgarejo, also my colleague in Universidad, Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Thank you, Professor Mari. And now, Professor, uh, Professor Francisco Valenzuela will present the Segundo Colloquio Sudamericano de Género, Trabajo y Organización 2021. Francisco Valenzuela is professor of the business school in Universidad de Chile, and he is a member of the colloquio organizing committee. Professor Francisco, you can share the news. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, hi, everyone. Hola a todos, a todes. Um, I'm, I'm Francisco Valenzuela. I'm a assistant professor at the Department of Administration in the Universidad de Chile, Universidad de Chile, University of Chile, and also uh, associate editor at the journal Gender Work and Organization. I just uh, want to briefly talk to you about this colloquium we're organizing uh, in preparation for the 2022 conference in Bogotá. This is a um, an event that uh, we were kindly invited to organize by editors in chief Alison and Banu from the journal. And uh, it's a very, very interesting opportunity to share ideas and to listen to dialogues between scholars from all over Latin America. Um, this is going to happen in November. It's going to be an online event, virtual event. Of course, considering the pandemic context, it was really difficult to to make uh, in-person events happen. So uh, hopefully that won't be an obstacle for the Bogota conference. So fingers crossed there. Um, basically, this event, this colloquium will be a series of panels and keynotes uh, speeches that are intended to promote uh, critical thinking around gender organization work. And um, uh, we, we uh, pursue basically three objectives with this, with this uh, little event. The uh, first one is we want to contribute to the construction of an international community around the GWO journal. Uh, it's, it, of course, we, we think this is a very, very important journal because it promotes critical thinking and especially interdisciplinary work, uh, at least in my experience, at least in my country. But we, we've seen this all over Latin America. Things tend to be very disciplinary and we need more connections. We need more bridges between countries, between faculties, between fields of work, fields of research. The journal really strives to accomplish those connections and with this event we want to accomplish that too. Another objective that we have is bringing together scholars coming from business and administration fields, organization studies, social sciences, with scholars coming from gender studies, feminist studies and other related fields. So trying to again to uh, generate this sense of uh, community and and uh, offer this hospital environment to have those discussions and in third place we want to promote the journal as a as a venue for uh, latin american scholars to publicize and discuss ideas and their research on gender work organization um, and especially when in, in the cases in which 
those research pieces are thematizing and working on Latin America as a as a as an empirical field. That we need more of that too. So I, I will just briefly um, share my screen and present uh, the details of this event. Um, okay, so I, I hope you can see clearly. I'll, I'll just read this very briefly. Um, so in 2021, the second gender work and organization Latin American Colloquium will take place at the Universidad de Chile. That's the sponsoring institution of this event between the 22nd and the 26th of November and will be convened by myself, um, Marcela Mandiola from Universidad Alberto Hurtado, some of you might know her, uh, and Nicola Rios from the Universidad de Barcelona. The theme of the colloquium will be reorganizing gender, reworking crisis, Latine bodies in conversation. Um, we wanted, of course, to include crisis because that's that's really the horizon that we're all trying to deal with, right? Crisis, pandemic, environmental crisis, economic crisis. Um, uh, we invite the international GWO community to join us in Santiago via Zoom for a week-long series of events where scholars from Chile, Latin America, and beyond will offer their perspectives on living through recent crises, the latest transformations of work, and the main challenges faced by those who seek to reorganize gender in contemporary society. The colloquium will consist of five different events, one for each day of the week, starting on Monday, the 22nd of November. On Monday, we will have an inaugural keynote speech by Professor Veronica Gago from Universidad de Buenos Aires, Argentina. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we will have three panels on current gender-related topics, respectively diversity, academia, and effective labor. On Friday, we will have a closing keynote speech by Professor Mariana Fotaki from the University of Warwick in the UK. Events will include artistic interventions and will foster the active participation of the audience. They will be open access to the public. Previous registration will be required. Uh, as, Ma as Mari said, uh, the language spoken mainly throughout the colloquium will be Spanish. Um, but Portuguese speakers are most welcome, and we will promote a neutral use of both languages to foster mutual intelligibility. Some portion of the colloquium will feature English, Spanish, Spanish interpretation or translation. And we also we want to um, have the recordings of all the sessions uploaded to YouTube with subtitles in English for future promotion and, and, and uh, diffusion. And this is a briefly a uh, schedule of the colloquium. So, as I said, Monday, 22nd, Professor Veronica Gago will give a keynote speech. Then we'll have a panel on diversity, theme, organizational heteronormativity from inclusion to subversion. Um, then on Wednesday, we'll have a panel on academia, reorganizing academia. The uh, theme here is Killing Joy at the University. Uh, we have uh, guests here, Ana Luisa Muñoz, Jenny Rodriguez, Sebastián Madrid. And Thursday, we'll have a panel on Affective Labor. The theme is Servant Emotions, Perplexed Bodies, Fleshing Out the Critical Voice of Affect. And we have guests, uh, Ana Abramowski, Encarnacion Gutierrez Rodriguez. And finally, on Friday, keynote speech by Mariana Fotaki. So that's it. You are all invited. We hope to see you there in preparation to the Bogota 2022 conference. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And please, uh, uh, let's move to the discussion. OK. Thank you, Francisco. OK, thank you, Francisco. Excellent, excellent event, excellent colloquium. The colloquium and the conference, the idea is we, are, we have been in a permanent conversation in the last in the last week, and it's excellent uh, to be the how the colloquium is developing, previous to to the conferences. It's an excellent um, uh, um, previous activity uh, to um, as a it's a learning activity. I can say. Okay, so uh, now we can start our conversation. I want to share again my, my screen just to present our guest, our panelist. And it's a pleasure to have you here. We have 
for this part of our activity, our, our panel today. As you can see, we have uh, three special guests. We have Professor Camila Suseneta Nascimento in Ganga. Professor Camila is professor in Federal University of Uberlandia. Uberlandia is located in Brazil. I'm not, going, I'm not going to read all the bio. You have the bio in our files, but Professor Camila is one of our guests. He, she holds a PhD in controllership and accounting, and she is a researcher in some topics in, in education, in gender. It's really great to have you here, Camila. And we have Professor Barbara Boss. Barbara is a lecturer in financial accounting in the Canberra Business School and is a member of the UC Ali Network. Uh, her research interest uh, is related to aspects of accounting, politics, regulation, and discourses. It's just going, they are going to talk about their research, so I'm going to read all of, it, all of this. And we also have, welcome Barbara, and we also have Professor Alison Pollen. Alison Pollen, we have to say she was born and raised in Wales, in the UK, in the United Kingdom. Alison is Professor of Gender World and Organization at Macquarie University and visiting professor at Bath University. And Alison, as we know, is co-editor in chief co-editor-in-chief for Gender War and Organization in the journal on division share elect in the Critical Studies Management Division of the Academy of Management. So welcome, Alison, welcome the, the two of you. And we're going to have our conversation uh, from this moment. Uh, we prepare some questions and please, uh, those who are with us in the YouTube channel, send your, your question, or those who are maybe connecting from other networks, send, send your question to the chat. We had some minutes after our preliminary questions, our conversation. We have some minutes to share the question that we received on the chat uh, to um, keep the conversation with our guests. So the, the, the first question, the first set of questions that we want to share with you, uh, with uh, um, Camila, Barbara, and Alison, can you summarize the main aspect of your recent or current research related to gender? And how could this research be related to the GWO 2022 call for strings suggested topics? Uh, just to organize our, our order, uh, we're going to move around the, the three guests. In this, in this uh, first question, I suggest Camila, then Barbara, and then Alison to answer this first set of questions. Um, you have five minutes. Each of you have five minutes to comment on this uh, topic. So Camila, if you want to, to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mari, first for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here to talk about my research with Barbara and Elsa. It's like an uh, honor for me. So about the question, now I am like na navigating between being a PhD student and be a professor and researcher because this position is really new in my life. So, and also due to the pandemic, I am still work with some articles from my PhD dissertation. So it's, this is my point at this night, night here in Brazil. So in my dissertation, I was interested in understanding a little better of the experience of women inside the Accounting Academy, focus on the female PhD students in Brazil and also in the United States. Um, in my dissertation, I was interested also in understanding how the experience that women live during their PhD in accounting impacted their uh, 
academic identity, identity constitutions. So this, this was my main point of my dissertation. So now when I am like thinking about the conference and about this call for streams, I have a lot of topics that dialogue with my, my research. So for example, in the area of organization, it is very important to think about how the accounting and management areas act on the necessary change so that women and other underrepresented groups really take part in these spaces and also have positive experience. In addition, specifically in the accounting academy, at least here in Brazil, there is a persistence of the heteronormativity. So we have a lot of white and straight male in the space of power, for example. Although we women are already the majority of, of as undergraduate students, master's students, and also undergraduate professor, the postgraduate professor are mostly men. So one of the points of my dissertation was how do women doctoral students socialize trying to become professors if they are not seeing themselves as professors? <laughs> if, for example, role, model, role models are scarce, sometimes an inexistent, who represent their lives, their experience, and their expectations? So how to deal, for example, with the fact that being uh, an academic and being a mother, having children are still incompatible <laughs> and in some cases undesirable in the context of the accounting academy. And how to also, and how to reflect about all of this, thinking about the interse intersectionalities of race, gender, identity, sexualities, and class, for example. So I'm thinking, where are the trans women in the accounting academy? And if they are not present in this space, why is this, why not? And another point, Mar Mari, in terms of research, I realized that maintaining an idea of wh what is research and what is va valid science, valid science, sorry, in accounting promotes a very exclusionary environment, which brings challenges to those, to the trajectory of the people who seek to develop research outside the positivism, for example. And thinking about research with a focus on gender, race, and other intersection is, even if it is not like ex ex exclusive, is very related to inter interpretive and critical perspectives. So in accounting, we still have a lot of stereotypes involve such perspective of uh, research. For example, this is not research, this is not science, is this accounting? Sometimes we, we, we hear a lot of these things. So for example, at my quali qualification exam for the PhD, I heard, your research, your research is too feminist <laughs> in a highly pejorative tone. For me, it was like a compliment, but was not the case. <laughs> so just for finish my, my, my answer, I am very happy to see this kind of actions that promote the opening and maintenance of this space of the development of critical and interpretive, inter, interpretive research in accounting. For example, we had the editions of the qualitative research and critical accounting event that happened here in Latin America. And this is why I'm also so happy to having the gender work and organization conference in Bogota in 2022. So I think it's kind of this way. Thank you, Camila. Thank you. It's, it's really interesting to, to, to see how you are developing your, your, your ideas, how you are evolving in this kind of research and related to a content. No? We, can, we, can, we can discuss this about this later. Now, now we are going to move to Barbara's comments. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, just um, 
uh, here is good morning. I'm in Australia. Just to let you know as well, I'm Brazilian. Um, so I'm living in Australia, but also Brazilian. And I've been also in the Latin America conferences. So I'm in the between words. I'm feeling that I'm a hybrid person sometimes. But anyway, um, but, but my particular research, um, which is, I think, linked to somehow as well, um, chameleon researches as well, is um, about understanding uh, professional identities currently in people um, working in um, professional services, which was previously known as accounting firms. Um, and those people are um, part of the LGBTI community. So identifying, understanding um, gender, identifying sexuality, uh, also discussing race, religious, parenting, and also culture beliefs, languages, um, culture backgrounds. Um, and um, it's been amazing um, how many people approach me and being willing to share these stories. And I was, um, I'm very pleased to say that um, I'm very lucky to be in this field and I'm, I never feel that I'm out of the world as Camilla sometimes feel that some people pushing you to the boundaries, but I'm, I'm very strongly doing something that I really love doing. So um, I, I don't care sometimes what people say, especially if it's negative. I think we have to keep moving because that's how we can make the, the world better. Um, in terms of gender, which is something that was very unique experience as well, I cannot talk about um, in, in name of people who are, I, I, they share these stories with me, but I can uh, share a little bit what I feel in related to their stories. Um, gender is sometimes seems in a very binary view, like male, female, it's not. And, and, and that's um, and something that I think we are moving towards a more non-binary, gender neutral or a more diverse gender and, and, and not having the idea that you were born in this, um, you are not born in a gender. <laughs> you are born, basically we have a confusion between sex at birth and gender. And, um, and it's very simple things that, um, you know, Charlotte, they just recently uh, released a census and ask people, who, uh, what is, how do you identify? And then the, the question was male and female. It was like, well, I think, I don't know what they are asking, whether they talk about gender or they are talking about sex, uh, which is completely confusing. And uh, I think we have a lot of things to be done in that space. Um, also, um, some interviewees share stories that they actually, they change the gender. So the idea that some person will just have the same gender the whole life is not true. I think we also have to move the idea that gender is trans transitional, momentary, contingent, is not something that's stable. Um, and that the same thing as transgender person, which is a transgender person is in a stage of transition. It's not a stage of um, a, a, a set in stone stage. So they can be in, in the first transgender person, but not for too long. Sometimes they just transition into a different gender or different perspective, what they believe who they are. Um, and that creates space, as we know, of research. Who are people, how people can be, how they are in different space. And I'm, I'm saying as well that um, even though I'm doing research most of the time here in Australia, but I'm lucky, lucky to also have people overseas being part of my research. In, in some ways, what I'm seeing is um, we have, of course, we have the context of countries that limiting what people can be and what they can express, but we have um, different expressions in different um, organizations, different teams, different leaders, um, people with different experience and backgrounds. So all of them together uh, makes um, our research very particular sometimes in specific space and a specific moment as well. Um, I think in terms of um, my research connecting to GWO uh, 2022 um, themes and streams that are happening soon, and we are going to see the themes coming. Um, the idea of North and South, Non-Western and Western, it's also about who are included, who are excluded, 
uh, I think the idea as well of heteronormativity, uh, spaces that are set in a specific thoughts, ideas as well of masculinity, which is coming from the post-colonial as well, uh, ideas that the masculine needs to prevail in any form. And that's somehow um, transfer from any genders is not a specific gender anymore. We are spreading out these kind of thoughts that we, we need to relearn how to be uh, more complete humans, not just focus on masculinities, but more focus on femininity as well, because we all complete in all of that together. We, we don't say that masculinity is a bad thing, but only have that is not a good thing. <laughs> That's the idea we have to, to be more um, aware that we need to um, be open and, and be more um, willing um, to accept the difference, willing to accept that we are all different, all different in many ways. We we speak different language, we dress in different way, we we see things in different things, and we we are um, living in different contexts as well. So we all um, have differences. Um, I don't know if I come across. I I know uh, I came for many areas, but I hopefully that was something that can relate to you as well. Thank you, Barbara. Really, really nice comment. Uh, I'm going to pass the microphone to Alison. Thank you, Mary and the team for um, inviting me. I'm very uh, honored to, uh, to talk uh, today with Camilla and Barbara. And uh, I should acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the Gadiga land of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any indigenous people uh, here today. This land is commonly known as Sydney and a land uh, that remains unceded. Um, I speak to you as a Welsh woman, as Mary uh, says, and that's really important to me because uh, I'm often seen as English. Um, and I speak to you as a feminist researcher uh, in a business school, uh, as an organization studies critical scholar of gender work and organization. And I'm very proud to be a feminist researcher to uh, Camilla and, and Barbara. And I acknowledge that this feminist research that I do allows me to breathe when uh, the challenges and the barriers to feminist researchers uh, come through our daily work, whether it's in the classroom or with the research that we do or the community work that we do um, outside of our day job. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge that this feminist research uh, is, is one of, of struggle and, uh, and contestation in, uh, in being able to do the feminist work that we do and to put care and community and others before, our, before ourself. And, and that connects to some of the recent uh, work uh, that I've been doing. Um, I've been working uh, with colleagues uh, on issues of sexual harassment in Australian organisations, uh, looking at the ways in which uh, organisations need to make structural and cultural changes in order to address uh, systemic uh, problems and violence uh, towards women and other feminized subjects. Um, I've also been doing uh, work on domestic violence or intimate partner violence, uh, looking at the ways in which um, organizations need to become more responsive and responsible uh, for uh, people facing uh, violence uh, at home. And I've also been uh, finishing an Australian Research Council grant with colleagues on leadership diversity, uh, looking at the ways in which gendered, raced and class bodies uh, experience organisations 
and uh, experience diversity very differently. So we've been doing um, ethnographic work with a range of organizations. Um, so on the one hand, um, some of my research is empirical and practical, and some other of my research, I'm very interested in thinking through the opportunities for different uh, types of knowledge in the field of gender work and organization, whether that's through different forms of writing or different uh, types of feminist thought. And I'm really interested in uh, understanding the ways in which feminized bodies and their allies uh, mobilize, how we organize work together, uh, in order to create community, solidarity, but also resistance against uh, patriarchal uh, forms of knowledge and the people that represent that. Um, and also to um, resist the erasure of feminist work in the field. So I'm very, very excited about the Bogota conference because the call is inclusive, it's, uh, it's interdisciplinary, uh, it is um, an opportunity for those of us that have lived in the north but migrated south and who live on lands of, of, of which uh, represent struggle between the, co the colonial oppressors and indigenous people. It's an opportunity to think about the ways in which local knowledge and uh, local people offer us alternative ways of seeing our own discipline, um, how, how we see even uh, the ways in which we use and talk about, about gender and, and their, their intersectional differences. So um, the idea of building bridges, um, I uh, very, very much uh, welcome. And I'm going to use the conference to think about, um, I, I, I'll divert, Mary, do you remember we were in the at the first um, uh, South American workshop mm -hmm. in Sao Paulo, and you had bought uh, De Souza Santos's book, and you said to me, Alison, how do you how do you not know this work? And I said, I know I'm so ignorant. Please, I've got to get my hands on these books. So I have. And I was, I've been kind of uh, trying to read around cognitive empire, um, but also um, uh, trying to read um, the, uh, the feminists uh, from Latin America to really challenge the ways in which I even think about research. So that's the kind of work that I'm trying to do leading up to um, Bogota. I very much hope to be on the ground with you. Um, and I, you know, I really want to kind of use this space to challenge um, Eurocentric knowledge as a, as a, as a Welsh woman. Um, and also really try and tackle the persistence of violence towards women and the backlash that feminists have uh, are facing by us growing and building momentum across our lands. Great. Great, great. Oh, great insights from the three of you, from uh, Camila, uh, was uh, highlighting. I I I read uh, Camila's words um, as a uh, still exploring exploring a lot of issues because our context has so many uh, scenarios to 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 do research. Uh, and Barbara is is, is like trying to highlight the, 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 the uh, also reading about, about your research, uh, the, this, uh, um, the, the situations that 
are present in one specific context in, in the firms and in the professional services. But the last, the last uh, comment from Alison about some literature in, in Latin America um, reminds me one conversation that we have maybe um, in, in, in some minutes, Julie can, can also uh, do the, 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 that's the question again. Yesterday we were talking about what kind of streams we, we are accepting in the conference. We don't know, we, we expect the streams and then we can, and, and Sandra was also uh, reflecting about how are, we going to, how are we going to review the streams in a mainstream way or in which way. And, and, and one part of our call for stream uh, highlight this also uh, is, 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 is open. So one of the questions of my colleague, Julie, he said yesterday, uh, what happened with people that is not a, a researcher, but want to, want to share experiences? What happened with communities? What happened with people that uh, needs to say something, need to spread their experiences, their, 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 their voice? That's the idea. So how to uh, have some strings to just express voices. So going beyond maybe traditional or mainstream research, this is, we don't know. So this is in the, in the making. <laughs> okay, I, I am going to just uh, move on. And Sura is going to, to talk about the, the, the next set of questions. Let me check here. Yes. Let's move to our second question. Are gender research topic changing, changing during the COVID-19 pandemic? And are research approach methods related to gender study changing or evolving to consider the pandemic scenario? What are you thought about this? We can now listen first to Barbara, then Alison and Camila. Barbara. Thanks, Arai. Um, good, good questions. Um, I think pandemic in, in some ways exacerbated issues that you already we already have. It's not like we create a new issue, we just that just become more obvious and more in our face. So um, what I feel in, in my particular research really helped me because people really want to share, really want to talk, really want to, to ex express themselves. And most of the time, um, because my type of interviews is mostly interview based. So it means um, they are not working anymore in the firms or they are not working in a very professional environment. They are working from home. So they have kids, they have dogs, they have their own, you know, they probably sometimes formal with a shirt like I am and not dressing in a formal pants. You can dress whatever you are because you just bought top, whatever you want to wear. Um, and that creates some more relaxed kind of conversation. Um, um, unless, of course, sometimes people might be extra stressed because um, if we are talking about physical and mental health issues as well, and COVID can affect, affect all of us. Um, but in general, when people are willing to talk, they are really okay to talk. <laughs> and, and that's the moment that I, I have very amazing experience in that space. Um, in terms of methodologies, approaches, I, I really hope that the journals and, um, you know, areas that we adapt to um, new, new ways of doing things, new methodologies, new methods, the idea of you sharing how you actually do things, not how people used to do, and what is affecting your particular research. I think that's the type of research that I normally do, and that's I hopefully um, editors and journals are open to that. If not, I keep moving until I found someone so you can listen to me or can like, please, this is important. I'm not moving because this is important. Um, 
But um, I know that some um, journals are very keen to just focus in the specific methods or methodologies, which is um, unfortunately. But um, in my opinion, um, really helped me in many ways. And I'm, I'm more keen to share more myself as well. So um, because I'm doing research on LGBTI space, so I share my, my own experience, who I am, how I identify, how they're affecting my research. So I'm more willing to share this, this who I am in rather than other research that are not in the same space. So in some ways, um, it is affecting. People are more willing to share. Um, and I think we are more focused on um, expression of humans than actually on things of how numbers affecting. This has become something very boring. I, I, I cannot read those kind of particular papers anymore. It's like, what is that relevant for us today? We have so many more important issues to discuss, not just numbers. So I think um, moving forward, hopefully um, that's affecting more positively and I see more positive change actually. Thank you. <laughs> Barbara. Thank you, Zarai. I was thinking about going third and you've, you know, really confused me um, uh, this morning. Um, yeah, uh, I agree uh, with, um, with uh, Barbara uh, that the pandemic has really uh, changed the ways in which we think of ourselves in relation to um, our research. Um, and I will confess that I've locked my dogs out because they usually bark on every Zoom, but I want to acknowledge that I'm fully dressed today from the head to the toe just for, for, for this because I'm not usually, even when I'm teaching. Um, but uh, uh, seriously, um, I think, um, Given the um, extreme pressures that uh, we've been facing, uh, even in countries with uh, small uh, numbers of COVID cases, uh, good health systems, uh, vaccinations, the uh, pressures that people have been in, under uh, in relation to being in lockdown, which again is a very kind of privileged position to be in, um, is, is kind of overwhelming to think about. So in Australia now, I've been in lockdown, I think this is the 13th week this time, and that's a, that's a privileged uh, position. What surprises me is how uh, organisations haven't really accommodated uh, the pandemic, um, from my experience, uh, it's, uh, it's business as usual. Um, everything is carrying on normally. Uh, there's very uh, little uh, acknowledgement uh, for those people who are engaging in care activity of elderly, uh, sick uh, children, new babies, etc. So I'm amazed to see how resilient people have been in carrying on as normal. And then knowing that when you can't carry on as normal, you kind of feel, you know, a failure because you're not able to perform to that, that standard. So when I think about the research that's been coming through gender work and organization, uh, since the pandemic. I'm amazed at how many papers we've had. We've had um, over 300 papers on COVID. Um, so on the one hand, even the most privileged of us um, are clearly affected and our work has decreased, but the amount of papers coming into gender work and organization has increased uh, drastically. And the stories that they're, they're telling are of uh, profound inequalities, and Barbara's right, those inequalities have exacerbated. Uh, they are affecting uh, the most vulnerable of populations. Um, they are talking about uh, issues of poverty. 
um, but also the changing role of parenting and care work uh, during the pandemic. Um, a lot of papers on fatherhood and the ways in which the pandemic has created different um, um, conditions for parenting, but also um, the predominant story coming through is that uh, organizations have not considered the care work that women do and that the care work that we do remains invisible and uh, that there are no provisions for it. So it's very exciting to see the work of uh, Tithi Bhattacharya uh, coming through on life-making work, uh, looking at uh, social production theory, uh, a lot of writing, uh, drawing on Silvia Federici's uh, uh, work um, to, uh, to raise the issues of inequalities, particularly uh, for women uh, during the pandemic. Um, but also it's very um, evident to me that um, the, the pandemic has offered an opportunity for those women in the global south to represent their work in ways um, because we opened up um, an avenue at the journal to be able to uh, publish shorter pieces on the pandemic. Um, so that meant that, that women who were very uh, short of time could write shorter pieces um, on smaller sample sizes, um, looking at uh, women's experiences of, of COVID. We're also seeing some large scale surveys uh, coming through and some quantitative review pieces, uh, but predominantly it's qualitative research and a lot of pieces um, which are autoethnographic and would be classed as writing differently. Uh, so people are experimenting with poetry, etc. And Alison and Camila. <laughs> thank you, Zurain. So thinking about the discussion related to my research, uh, I think I can focus on three existing talks that with the pandemic gain more evidence or and prominence like Barbara said. So the first point I think Edison just discussed about this is the women and the division of labor and work-life balance or work-life conflict. <laughs> because the pandemic has made the daily lives of women even more challenging. So given that maybe studying and or working from home even with all the privilege of this, the work days are endless. And especially for those who have children, right? So here it's also necessary as Barbara brought to think about the intersectionality, the intersection, I'm sorry, of class. Because for example, at least here in Brazil, for the, the women who are poor, in addition to conflict, the, the issues of work-life balance, the, there are no adequate material conditions to work from home, like computer and internet and office items. And also another point here is that women are the majority in family care and in the professions, professions involved with care like nurses and PT and psychologists and people who are like working at the rest home for elderly people. So this is the reality here in Brazil, which brings a triple way to them because it's like they have the responsibility to of caring for the others and be a danger to their families because they are like work outside and came. <laughs> Another point is the socialization in this online world. We are like reconfiguring our, our lives, our ways of socialize and 
when I think about this, when I think about the Accounting Academy on this point of socialization, uh, a situation I experienced some weeks, last weeks, like last weeks, I don't remember right now, caught my attention on this point. I, I am participating in a mentory program for undergrad, undergraduate students who are, who are Black. And during a session, uh, I, I heard from a Black woman, a young Black woman, that it was very good to study at home, not only because of the convenience, like Barbara and Edison brought, but mainly for not having to physically live in, a, in an environment where there were only white people. And I was huh. <laughs> So this made me reflective for a few days because I was like thinking about how the, la la the lack of opportunity for socialization, which, one of, which is one of the worst part, the worst points of pandemic, like the need for social isolation and remote work can actually have a good side for people from minority groups. So for example, Thinking about Alison talk about harassment, I was like, so now think about how many women do not need to deal directly with situation of moral and sexual harassment. So <laughs> I think this needs to be considered. So how to reflect on the post pandemic scenario in light of this, how to build new forms of socialization that truly include these people. I was thinking about this. And the third point, it's about mental health. So this is not new, but I think it's like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I always think about mental health because these two points, like thinking about work-life battles or conflict, thinking about socialization, for women and other minority groups has relations with mental health. So what are the graduate programs developing in, in terms of direct support, like psychology, psychological care, for example, and also in, indirect support. So for example, it's structures that better receive women, women who are mothers, for example. Whose responsibility is it? So I am thinking about the institutional responsibility for the mental health, not, not only for students, but also for the work, the workers like professor and others who is like doing with this kind of things. And just, um, just a brief point about the research approach and methodology, metho methods related to gender and pandemic scenario, I, I, I believe that even before the pandemic, there were like a lot of technological resources that allowed for some methodological choice and approach. So for example, in my research during, during the, the conduction of the interviews for, for, for my PhD dissertation, I was doing my visitor work at the University of Minnesota. So I was talking with a lot of different women in Brazil and in, also in the United States. And all the interview were done online. And I remember that was really good because I, I was able to create a really safe and re, really reliable and welcome space. And this was essential for the, the, the histories I've heard. And we cry a lot, so it was, was a really welcome space. And I'm, I was happy to, to hear about Barbara and the experience because I'm always like, mm, what about this right now in the pandemic? How to build this kind of space? Because people, they are tired about the screens, like they have a, an expression, right? Zoom fatigue. fatigue. And also today I was talking with João Paulo, who is my friend, who is doing his PhD in accounting at the University of São Paulo and certainly one of most, most important role models 
role models for me. And he was saying this, so do it to the Zoom fatigue and this forced adoption of technology. We don't have another <laughs> choose. So we need to think of ways to welcome people who will participate in our research and who are isolated at home. So do not see them only as research participants, so, but as human beings. And the, so think about the ways of welcome them before and after the interviews, for example. I think this is a thing we need to, to do even without pandemic, but I think right now it's a really important thing to, to, to pay attention. So I think it's this what I when I think about this question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, Lisa, and Camila. Uh, let's move our next provocation. Mari. Uh, thank you, Zurai. Interesting. I have some comments, but maybe, maybe at the end. Um, uh, just, just a brief comment. I can, I can avoid a brief comment. And the one that is uh, for me is impossible to publish to the research in this scenario. It's, it's really complicated, but it's, 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 it's really uh, interesting. The, the experiences that you have in comparing, for example, Barbara and Camila is, is really different. It's for, for Barbara, it's easy to it's easier to to have uh, uh, the interviews. And on the other hand, it's, it's harder. It's, it's, and considering the context, but we have uh, from our question and, and please, uh, people that is. Uh, um, watching the, the transmission through YouTube, please, you can use the chat to send your questions, your comments uh, to, to you, we, can, we can read here in the, uh, uh, also the people that is in the, connected in the Zoom, in the Zoom channel, just send the question, then you, we can open also the microphones to uh, after this third question, we can interact to each other. And, and also if our panelists have questions to each other, you can do that. But for from us, the, our final uh, question, provocation, and this one related to the GWO 2022 conference, in your opinion, what are the main opportunities and challenges that may face the organizers, the authors and the participants that will be part of this conference, the Bogota conference, in terms of the consolidation of the GWO community. So now we're going to change again the order. Uh, I suggest Alison and then Camila and finally Barbara. So Alison, you can be the first one. Thank you so much. I have a confession before I start. The, the dogs that have been locked out are now with me. And the big dog's hitting my arms. If you see my arm Don't going worry. like this, it's because he needs extra cuddles because animals Don't are not used to being on their own in Australia with, with, with lockdown. So, um, Par yes. Part of the pandemic. Is part of the pandemic. <laughs> My yeah, dog I, is I, out of the, of the room right now, but yeah, he's, he's waiting because, outside the door. Yeah, because it's not just about people. And I, I think, you know, if, if, if I may, there was one thing that I, that I forgot uh, to say when, um, when Camilla was speaking, that in the Australian context, the cases of uh, domestic violence has increased. Uh, during the pandemic. So this is some area of work that I think needs specialized treatment. And that's where kind of interdisciplinary scholars can actually work together to, 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 to think that through. Um, so I think this is a quick, uh, um, um, I think this is a really difficult trick question uh, from uh, Mary 
for us uh, to think through about the opportunities and the challenge. I think um, the opportunities, uh, I mainly see opportunities. Um, so the, um, the opportunities for uh, local scholars and communities is that perhaps um, a conference that has always been elsewhere uh, that seemed off limits is now in Bogota and people can attend uh, this big conference locally. Um, I think in relation to the field, um, the theme is so timely and so important as we think through the issues of uh, coloniality and decoloniality, uh, particularly in relation to the journal Gender Work and Organization and thinking through the work of feminist and transnational feminist or decolonial feminist uh, writers in relation to, um, to the field. Um, I think uh, the idea of building bridges across disciplines in relation to gender work and organization is, uh, is so exciting. Um, but we should think through that it is always one of, of, of struggle um, and maybe therefore the challenges for authors and participants is that uh, is, is how to work across multiple languages. Um, and that is, is, um, is a challenge for the organizers in terms of how to coordinate uh, these uh, different contributions, both in terms of different streams in different languages and also um, uh, different participants from around the world who are very excited to join the conference. Yeah. So I think I think it's also an opportunity and a challenge for those of us who don't speak um, uh, Spanish and Portuguese to think about how to engage fully in, in, the, in the conference, um, but also in terms of training ourselves to listen uh, to the different ways in which uh, people communicate locally. Um, so I've been trying to train myself for many years and I still fail, but I think this is something, how do you use um, different mediums to communicate um, so that we can have that embodied experience? And I remember at the closing address from the Gender Work and Organization Kent Conference, when Sandra played the music and we were asked to just close our eyes and breathe from Kent to Bogota. And already we were being sensitized to a different culture. So I think, um, I think I'm really excited to take part in um, a conference that is culturally sensitive um, that's critical of empire building, um, both in terms of history, but also the ways in which we reproduce empire in our, um, in our practices, whether it's in our universities or in our journals or in our daily lives. Um, I think maybe um, a challenge is, you know, a, a, a lot of people, Mary will know this, are saying academics shouldn't fly anymore because there is the climate crisis. But I think to have the hybrid conference is, um, is, uh, is a fantastic intervention because many people uh, find Zoom more accessible. Uh, so, you know, for me, uh, GWO 2022 Bogota is full of opportunities for me, it's about listening and learning 
um, about uh, the local culture, the local work, the ways in which uh, local academics work differently to where I've worked. And I wish you all the best of luck with it. It's going to be amazing. Thank you, Alison. You, you just have, have to be careful comparing Colombian coffee with other coffees. That's true. <laughs> so you, you have to be careful. No, don't, don't say any, anything else. <laughs> no, but I have to confess, they're both fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Every coffee has a good taste. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have next. Oh, I, I lost my order. Sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Now we have Camila. Camila. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Maria, about this question, I was reflecting uh, about the academic dialogues that are like close to critical research for those who are like doing some critical work or trying to do. I think it's very important to think about the practical actions in addition to research. I think this is really important for those who claim themselves as critical researchers. So, so now I think about the GWO community and the GWO event in Bogota next, next year. I wrote some points here. I think the, the, the first thing is the establish, establishment of networks for researchers to connect. For example, this event is an excellent example. I'm very happy, like I said, to be part of it. And also I was thinking related to this with some action, not only for the event, but, but for the, the for, connect more the community involved in GWO during all the time, not only for the event. So for example, I was thinking maybe inside the GWO community, we can design like mentoring actions for graduate students who are part of this community, especially those belong to minority groups. I was thinking about this because of my experience, for example, trying to do some out of box research, I don't like this expression, but trying to do some critical and inter interpretive work in accounting is very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult. And also for people who are like doing PhD, like for, is, is starting their path as research, researchers, it's really hard. So maybe, for example, mentors could be more experienced researchers within the community. And I think I will, I, I am always think about mentoring programs and mentoring actions, because in Brazil, we don't have. So when I was doing the, the, the PhD exchange in Minneapolis, and I was like, work uh, interviewing a lot of American women or women who were, were like doing their PhD there, I, 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 under, I understood that the mentoring programs and the mentoring action was really common there. I, I'm, I'm not sure about Barbara and Alison context, but here in Brazil, we, we don't have this figure. We only have the advisor who will work with you for your, your research. But the word, the word of PhD and research and academic, it's much more than, than just your research. So this is why I think how I think about the, the mentoring programs. And I think it's really powerful for us. Um, specifically for the GWO 2022, I was thinking as Alison about like, practical ways to make the event more inclusive. So especially for those participants who cannot afford to participate. So if it is online, will there be an affordable price for people with social vulnerability, for example? 
if we, it will be in campus on on site, maybe think about financial support to pay for tickets for some people. Usually, maybe we have some brilliant people or not. Some people who really want to be part of it, but maybe people they don't have like money to to do this kind of things. Also think. Think, also think about ways to welcome women with children and also, for example, people with disabilities or specific needs. And the, the last thing is uh, as Alison brings, and I think Mary brings to, brought to, sorry, at the beginning, um, the event is like presenting some the colonial reflections like beyond the borders. So one thing that may be important to think about is the possibility of bringing, for example, social movements to think about the, the researches together or people outside the academy. Because when I think about the colonial reflex, reflection in these bridges between South and North, I am thinking like North coming to the, to, the, to, to the South, right? And I think this will be really interesting to see like people from outside the academy with all of the, their knowledge, bringing the, their experience and the, their reflections to Is this my, this is. Hey, Camila, hey, Camila. And Barbara. Thank you. Um, I think also in a reflection of the previous question, I have to acknowledge the privileged position that um, I am in, in terms of what type of research I'm doing. Um, I'm not, um, the type of interviews that I've done um, are from people that are able to work from home. They are working in big corporations. They are not small corporations. They are in big cities. Um, and, and that's, that's a, a big difference in terms of research nowadays when you actually sometimes cannot go to um, rural regions or very local regions, travel to specific areas to connect. Um, so it depends on type of research you do in this area, you might not be able to do. So I have to acknowledge that um, I am very lucky that I was doing interviews with people there. I able to do interviews working from home and have a beautiful house and, you know, can actually, you know, be able to participate. But we also have um, um, interviewees that are especially parents. They have a lot of challenges as well. So um, in that sense, um, I acknowledge that. So. Coming back to the question as well, um, challenges and opportunities. I, I see um, challenges and opportunities because opportunities, I think, um, in, in this area, we have so many multiple ideas, diversities going on and how we connect to each other, how we're going to make uh, a common language or a common topic that people can feel connected. I think one of the major points, I think, is the idea of um, feeling of belonging or feeling that we are not alone and all of us has different perspective, but we all work in, in, in the same space of helping others. So I think that could be a common um, idea of connecting people. Um, and also because it's gonna be a hybrid conference, I. I hope that we'll work. I never tried. I've been work. I've been in conference that was um, not hybrid and that was completely online. But a hybrid, <laughs> it's. I think it's going to be a little bit challenging in the sense of how to bring these communities, local communities, experience to um, online platform, um, knowing that sometimes we have one camera, um, one microphone, <laughs> and we have a lot of people talking at the same time and how to bring that and um, create a, a atmosphere that people can understand and can engage in that, whatever they are, if they are in that space, which is, I think is much easier, but if they are outside um, um, you know, other countries in their local computer, so, I think that's, uh, I think, the major challenge, and I uh, hope you can bring some ideas. And I think that um, 
as, as much as possible, bring this kind of hybrid, ask for some scholars or um, to walk with the camera going on, walking in, in, the, in the events and sharing stories um, and, you know, bring this um, local atmosphere to, to um, other peoples outside who cannot travel, who are willing to be there. I've been in Bogota and I wish I could be back there, but, you know, um, so all of that kind of um, atmosphere that can, if can be possible to bring, would be amazing. Um, another thing that's that I think in in online platform is we don't have this corridor conversations. Like you're walking and someone stop start talking and you can engage on those conversations. We don't have anymore. And how to to bring in this um, environment? Um, there is a opportunities, as uh, Camila was saying, about mentoring or about maybe social groups or so um, ideas of trying to bring people together in different moments, not just during presentations or during, you know, discussions of papers, but in social gathering platform that you can invite it, um, all scholars to attend and it will be great, especially the senior scholars to attend it even more because that's the ones who bring more people and they really want to, um, um, a lot of people want to talk to them. Um, if I think um, senior scholars can know that <laughs> they know where, whatever they know, they go, people want to follow them. So um, bring this kind of activities, social um, activities, um, you know, mentoring or, it's just general converse, conversation. We are um, facing many mental health issues as well, isolations mm -hmm. through through this Zoom fatigue, as Camila was saying, or to um, busy life that we are in, in not managing that just the work life, but the families in as well. And how we can create an atmosphere that we can um, have. Um, scholars, we have um, other topics going on. I think I think that that's the idea of bringing in a conference um, rooms that people can just relax and talk about general things, and also, um, if possible, to bring some social activities throughout to all people, not just the local ones, but for ones that cannot be there and willing to be there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, thanks Barbara, Alison, and Camila. Yes, we have a lot of challenges. We, uh, I agree with Alison. We have more opportunities than challenges, but the challenges are there, especially the organizing a hybrid conference. But we're working on that. Don't worry, we're working on that. About the, the people that are worried about the the, the climate uh, issues uh, providing to traveling, of course, yeah. it's, just, it's one of the important, um, maybe positive impact for the pandemic because uh, we realized that we can do a lot of academic uh, discussions online. So uh, in, in my opinion, we can maybe prioritize what kind of traveling we can do. And I think uh, one of the issues that you are talking about mentoring is one of them. Uh, uh, if you are going to travel to a conference just to present a paper and to do some tour academic tourism, maybe it's, it's not worth it. But uh, one message that I can send on behalf of the organizing committee is if you think that you can contribute with your visit to Latin America, of course, if we have safe, a safety environment for all, and you can travel to Latin America, to Bogota, and contribute to our community with your uh, knowledge, your uh, enthusiasm, enthusiasm, especially, uh, to do mentoring, to know our young researchers, our senior researchers also. Uh, it would be great to have you here because I, I think I think it's a balance. Yeah, of course we have these uh, climate uh, concerns. Uh, I, I I think the same. Maybe it's not necessary to go to Australia to just to present a paper, 
but if I'm going there to do other things beyond presenting a paper, maybe maybe I can I can I can get this balance regarding to the carbon footprint and and this kind of uh, uh, discussion and, and climate concerns. So yes, yes, you're welcome to Bogota. Maybe not everybody are going to um, be able to travel, not only because of the climate, we also have a lot of issues regarding to the uh, employment. It's not a, a secret that the academic um, industry sector has been hit not maybe only because of the pandemic, because of the issues, and many of our colleagues are in trouble. So, so the idea is with, without pandemic or with pandemic, we are trying to, to organize some online sessions. I don't know, as Barbara, as Barbara was uh, commenting, um, um, I don't know if all, I'm sure that all the sessions cannot be uh, simultaneously on site and online. We have to do some sessions only on site, some sessions online, and some sessions could be hybrid sessions, especially those plenary sessions. We, we can, we have to organize this better, but we're working on that, I think. And thanks for, for your comments. I think on the committee here with me, uh, we have the better, a better uh, context or, or an expanded context about those challenges that we have a list. We have a list and now we have an, an extended list. <laughs> so thank you for that. And Surai. Now we can have a final round. If you want to add any comments, or thought about this conversation. You have two minutes to summarize a message. Who want to start? Barbara, Alison, Emilia. Some comments, general comments. I, I can start talking. Um, I, f I feel like um, this conference is um, it's we are lucky that we we could do it in, in Latin America and we have a lot of scholars supporting and having um, good interest as well in um, in Colombia um, and also um, people around Colombia helping this particular conference and I think the conference is um, must be in all the all of the places all over the world that used to be just specific in certain countries and certain regions and i'm i'm very pleased to see this movement of bringing um, different communities different con contexts to conferences and um, i think that idea as well to bring communities in the conference are very helpful too because um, we are nothing as scholars not integrating our research to the community because we are we are together we, we're not alone we we speak about people and um, it's better when the people speak by themselves that's something that I'm learning a lot in my, in my particular research so I cannot express all the, all of the stories by them for them I try as best as I can through my own view which is limited on my own experiences and as best as we can um, leave people to speak by themselves would be the greatest. And um, I think that's how we can move forward as, as communities, global communities um, in, in general. Another thing that's important to say, we discuss a lot of gender um, and we do have a lot of violence against women, especially after, after COVID, as Alison mentioned as well in Australia. But I don't think it's just Australia; it's all of the all of the world. Brazil is, I think, is the same issues, because this issue is still there. We still have a lot of things to to overcome. And um, if if because my particular research is in particular in LGBTI space that create even more. <laughs> so um, my, uh, my issue is every time we help a little marginalized group, we're helping so many other groups. 
So as, as many as we dig in a particular issue of women with color, with a person with disability or indigenous community, we are helping so many others uh, around us. Um, communities um, being ignored in, in this particular scenario, which is indigenous community. I can't speak by, my, by myself that I don't know my, my indigenous background. I know that I have some, but I don't know, I don't know how to name them because in Brazil, it's very, um, uh, it is um, completely ignored. It's the only thing that is being acknowledged is if you're European, um, and if you're African, you know, even say what, what part of Africa we're talking about because laborers didn't have families. <laughs> they didn't, was treated as things so for many years. So, um, and um, indigenous communities, the same thing. They are not even considered. We, initially, I know we have the acknowledge of country, which is acknowledge who are the, um, um, the custodians of the land, the land, but we still have to move forward to actually acknowledge how we can embrace their culture in the in Australian context. But, in, but this is not uh, happening in Brazil, for example, which is we don't even know, we don't even know how to name. So we have so much to do in this area, so much to do in terms of gender, so much to do in terms of embracing community. And I'm really help, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of um, this community, uh, GWO community now, and helping you as best as, as I can to share my stories too. Thank you. I can, I can talk more, Ari. I'm thinking about this question I saw Sylvia wrote on the YouTube comments. So I think it would be interesting to think about the, this academic women right now during the pandemic work, as we we reflected, I think a lot of uh, a lot of um, issues. It's like worse now. I don't think it's like a really new thing. I think it's just like worse. So. I'm always like thinking about the, the women, women I've interviewed in my dissertation. Like, what about right now? Like doing their PhD and having kids at home and have a lot of domestic work to do and have to deal with the masculinity of the Akani Academy and the stereotypes and the moral harassment and the lack of actions for teaching inside the programs and also the lack of research actions inside the programs because at least here in Brazil we have a pressure for publications which is not the same which it is not the same as like research training and reflections like for me it's a really two really different things so I'm I'm always really curious to think how about all of these things that appears in my dissertation right right now with the pandemic maybe if Sylvia wants to maybe if Sylvia accepts to work with me again <laughs> we can do some things together so Maris, just for finish my comments, um, thank you for inviting me to this moment. I'm really happy to think about all of these questions. And also today, early, I was in a discussion about power, coloniality, and necropolitics. And we were in a very safe space with a lot of Black researchers discussing some racial issues here in Brazil. And I said that in addition to the knowledge and thing we, we, we were like discussing in a specific paper, but these spaces help us to have some courage, courage some hope to continue. You, you know that it's really hard times here in Brazil specifically for us minority groups 
So this kind of safe space is really important for us right now to continue to struggle. So for me, certainly the GW22 in Bogota will be this kind of space too. Like not only to discuss research and studies on the main thing, but also to create space of empowerment for the people who will participate. So thank you, Mari and all the committee. Yes, thank you, uh, Mary, Zarai, um, uh, Barbara, and uh, Camilla. Uh, lots of inspirational um, thoughts uh, coming from you, and uh, gives me a lot to uh, to think about. Um, well, I guess my first reflection is I really have got two weeks to write the stream, right? So that's my first thought. Oh, it's only two weeks. I've got to get really uh, busy. Um, and I was thinking that um, uh, there are so many um, role models that we have um, from uh, communities uh, that uh, keep us going. Sometimes they're academic and sometimes uh, they're not and how we can create uh, those spaces or conversations with, uh, with local advocates, whether it's, you know, um, honoring the legacy of uh, Mariela Franco or, you know, so, you know, what are, who are the local women that have mattered um, in, in uh, South America in terms of shaping uh, women's uh, knowledge and, and resistance. So I was thinking about that um, uh, in order for us to not be erased and face the backlashes that, uh, that, that we do. I think Camilla and Barbara today have spoken about needing those spaces to be who we are. Um, and I think it's a, a really good reminder of needing different types of spaces for different people um, to be together. Um, and, you know, whilst I read um, a lot of Black feminist writers, you don't want me in those Black spaces. So I think, you know, as a journal, we have a call around race and racism, but we need to do much more to create spaces for um, for, for, for black scholars um, and indigenous uh, scholars. And I, I really um, was thinking about uh, the ways in which uh, we need to keep reminding ourselves of who's most vulnerable as we move through the next couple of years, uh, still going through the pandemic, uh, who will, reach the other side of the pandemic first. Um, so in, in Australia, we are very slow on vaccination and that's affecting indigenous communities more than, more than others. Uh, the people who have stricter lockdowns are in particular uh, ethnic communities. So we can see these inequalities emerging. So I'm wondering how do our academic spaces actually put back into the communities that, that we work in? Um, and um, a very good reminder today about, you know, um, the opportunities for mentoring and whether we can do that through the conference or, or through the journal um, in future. Uh, because I think we assume that there is informal mentoring and that people would just approach you. But maybe, Camilla, you were saying that there needs to be more formalized channels that people are aware of for that in different groups and across uh, different journal spaces and, 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 and conferences. Um, but in a nutshell, I need to write a stream. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I wouldn't get out of bed so early to be with lots of people, but the gender work and organization community is the community that I get out of bed for. Okay, um, so thank you so much for, um, for, um, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. 
Thank you. And we don't have enough time to continue the, our conversation. I, I really, I'm really happy. I'm really, uh, really happy. I, my English is, is getting off right now, but uh, just to express uh, our gratitude on, on behalf of the committee. It's not only me, it's Rai and, and other people that is here in, in the Zoom meeting and in YouTube. But a uh, uh, really great guest today to have this conversation. We can go keep going on at least for two more hours, but it's not idea. You need to do other things. I, I know you have your duties, but uh, just a couple of comments about this. Uh, uh, for example, the, the indigenous uh, comments that you, you uh, just uh, arise recently, Barbara and, and Alison and Camilla, native communities. But in, in my opinion, it's important also because sometimes I feel that to have the disco this discussion of this, uh, as Camilla was saying, these safety spaces, we try to isolate ourselves just to feel safe. But at the same time, it could be, uh, we can have some risk for exclusion for people that are also willing to work with us so it's, it's, it's complicated, I know, I know because uh, I, I talk from my own experience. Sometimes we uh, accept people to work with us, trying to, to, to promote this inclusion and we, we have problems. But uh, it's, at least in, in, in my own way of working, I try to promote this inclusion. So, how, how to deal, how to balance these safety spaces for people that had, had been working uh, with uh, discrimination. At the same time, how to try not to promote exclusion with people that sometimes they say, uh, I feel I, I have privileges, I don't want to uh, impose my privilege on your work. But at the same time, I feel that I am promoting exclusion for these people. So I think we need to work on this, how to, how to reach the balance, the, the right balance, the proper balance. But it is, it's, maybe it's just another discussion. Our idea is to have these activities in the future to promote, to also promote the call for papers, to keep promoting the conference for us as committee. The conference already started. It's not only three days. Um, um, uh, we wish that we have all the language mixed together in the activity, but it will be uh, a huge challenge to translate. We don't have the resources yet, but the, the idea is to also have this in, in English sometime to have this kind of panel. Uh, I don't want to apologize because of our English, because this is the Latin American English, as you can say. Uh, and actually, I recommend for people that maybe say, oh, we're going to Latin America, we're going to deal with this uh, pronunciation. Yes, you, have, you are going to <laughs> you are going to deal with our pronunciation. Uh, it's, it's, actually, there's a, a tech talk that is, is for me, is very, um, illustrative is from Heather Hansen. And the name is Two Billion Voices, how to speak bad English perfectly. I think it's, it's, a, very, it's, it's a very good message because uh, the, the main idea there is there uh, in, in, in her message is there are 2.4 billion English speakers in the world and two of them learn English in the classroom. So only 400 million people were born native English speaker. The rest of us, we try to do our best. Uh, um, so one of the challenges of the conference, yes, we need to communicate. So no, some of us will try to do this in English. So that's why we, we are going to organize this, some of these activities in, in, in this uh, language. But also uh, I just want to share with you the next activity that 
maybe the last activity we have before the deadline of the call for stream, just to leave the information. Uh, is this one? This would be in September 29th, in two weeks. Will be a stream from Chile, Chile, and will be a, this this one will be in Spanish and Portuguese, I think. Uh, and and the, the name is uh, the title is in Spanish. It's like they 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 selected this. This title, Raras Atrevidas Líderes Bonitas, is like weird. Uh, I don't know how to translate this, Atrevidas. It's, it's like uh, leaders, uh, uh, hands, uh, uh, pretty. It's like a meeting, uh, intergener intergenerational meeting of accounting women. So we'll be in the, in, the, in the pictures, we have some women from Brazil. We have Ana Carolina here from Brazil. We have Natalia from Chile, Silvia Casanova from Brazil. I can see here the, the, this face. Uh, and some of them uh, are not familiar to me. Some of them are from Chile. This is Alejandra from Colombia, Stefania, one of our students in Colombia, Candy from the committee, Catherine from the committee from Colombia. Uh, they are going to talk, uh, have a conversation. In September 29 will be this. Um, and we, you can you can see this um, um, this poster in our networks, and it will be at 6 p.m. in Colombia time, 8 p.m. in Brazil and Chile, and Australia will be like 9 a.m. maybe, and the next day in the future. So this will be the the next activity uh, to promote gender work and organization conference uh, 2022, and and just. Uh, to finish our activity today. Thank you to uh, Barbara, Alison, Camila. Thank you to Surai for uh, being with me in the, in the activity. Thank you to all the people in the, the Zoom uh, meeting, the organizing committee and the YouTube. This is going to be, it's going to be in YouTube permanently just for the people that are uh, in other time people in, for example, in Europe are sleeping now, but they, they're going to watch this uh, later in, it's, it's recorded. And the final invitation is, uh, please uh, uh, work with us, propose your, your stream to the conference and then it's open conference to different formats, different ideas and discussions. And of course, uh, you are invited to, to come to Bogota uh, in June 2022. I don't know if any one of you want to send a final word, but thank you very much for being with us. It's a pleasure. And yes, uh, good afternoon, good night, good day for everybody. Bye. Okay, bye. You can open your microphone and so you, you, you can be in the final screen. But you need to open your microphones yeah. and you can so say goodbye. I, I will say uh, buon notte and buenas noches. <laughs> Está perfecto. Está perfecto. And in, and in Welsh, you can say also in Welsh. Uh, I, I can't remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Okay, How terrible. How terrible. <laughs> <laughs> ok, perfecto, perfecto. Uh, buenas noches, buenas tardes y buenos días para Australia. Ok, bueno. <laughs>